Good morning, saints and sinners, and welcome to Eureka Springs United Methodist Church. If you're joining us online, we invite you to share with us your prayer request by sending us a message or posting there online as well. But we encourage everyone to reshare or like our services to push that message out to everybody. And if you will, go online and welcome our virtual guest, our virtual community of faith. This Easter tide, we begin our services by lighting the Easter candle, a symbol of Christ's love and life that is with us always. Christ's light rises in the darkness, and no darkness can ever overcome it. Amen. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. May we bow in prayer. Father, creator and sustainer of all, we thank you for this day. Here in your church home, we bow to honor and praise you, to unburden ourselves, to humbly ask for guidance, teaching, mercy, and forgiveness, to absorb your faithful love. Lord, we know that your spirit is with us every minute, no matter where we are. Give us the vision and grace to gratefully accept all your gifts and the willingness to use our hearts and hands to share with others. Please bring calm and peace to all those struggling with the darkness in their lives, the hungry, the homeless, the least, the last, and the lost. May we do the work you created us to do at this time in this place. We ask all these things through the power of the prayer that your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. We're glad you're joining us today. Let's worship together. Oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Oh, Sana, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of our salvation. by 
the Lord for he is worthy to be praised oh magnify the Lord for he is worthy to be praised oh Zion blessed be the rock Blessed be the rock of my salvation, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of our salvation. Let's hear that chorus again. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of our salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of our salvation. No other name but the name of Jesus. No other the name of the Lord, no other name but the name of Jesus is worthy of glory and worthy of honor and worthy of power and of praise. No other name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord. No other name but the name of Jesus is worthy of glory and worthy of honor and worthy of power and of praise. is exalted far above the earth his name is high above the heavens his name is exalted far above the earth and glory and honor and praises to his name no other name but the name of Jesus
The scripture today is according to the Common English Bible. It is from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 15 through 21. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say, I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You have had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Thanks be to God for the gift of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. afraid for I have redeemed you be not afraid I have called you by name when you pass through the waters I will be with you when you pass through the floods they will not weep for you not be consumed. You are mine. You are precious in my sight. Be not afraid, for I have redeemed you. Be not afraid, I have called you by I will be with you. When you pass through the floods, they will not weep for you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be consumed. You are mine. You are precious in my sight. My love for you is everlasting. My love for you shall have no end. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the floods, they will not sweep for you. You will not be consumed. You are mine. You are precious in my sight. You are precious in my sight. You 
are precious in my sight. You're welcome, Melody. <laughs> Imagine that helps. <laughs> Today we're going to contrast uh, two people, uh, two vastly different people from the Gospel of John. One is the woman that Jesus finds at the well, and the other is the man by the name of Nicodemus. Both stories appear together, and John means for us to contrast these two people with each other and their responses they make to Jesus. And think about that for a moment. You have the woman at the well, and you have Nicodemus. One has a name, the other doesn't. That, old, that age-old double standard, you know, women don't matter. I know Roman and Greek culture, uh, history, they made some amazing contributions to our world, but one of the more terrible things they did, they gave us the baggage of misogyny. They were horrible misogynists. Uh, Romans and Greeks just had a hatred towards women. And somehow that got filtered into biblical theology that we have to unpack and overcome. Uh, so you have Nicodemus who's named. You have the woman at the well who's not named. Nicodemus is a religious leader. The woman at the well is a Samaritan. Oh, Nicodemus is a Jew. He's an American. He's a true somebody. He goes to church every Sunday. He's taken every Bible study you can imagine. He knows the Bible forwards and backwards and can quote it to you at will. And you have the woman at the well who's a Samaritan, an outsider. Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans hated Jews. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he's embarrassed. He doesn't want to be seen with this Galilean peasant prophet because Nicodemus is a religious leader. He's been to seminary. He's got his doctorate. He knows all those biblical languages. He's an expert. He's a clergy. He's a bishop. Come, to come to Jesus, that would be embarrassing. That would be admitting maybe he doesn't know everything he professes to know. So he comes to Jesus at night. Jesus comes to the woman in the middle of the day at high noon in broad daylight where everyone can see Him. And I love the woman at the well because she is a rather feisty character. When Jesus met her, He goes up to her and says, Hey, give me something to drink. And the Samaritan woman, you know, she's a little snarky. I know most of you have never been around snarky people and you don't know what that means. But she's a little snarky. She says, well, buddy, how is it that you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? She's reminding him of the, the enmity the two people share, the Jews and the Samaritans. She's reminding him also of the customs of the day that strange men do not strike up conversations with strange women. That's not proper. And so she's reminding him of that. And, G and Jesus says, well, you know, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for that gift of living water. And the woman says, well, you know, this well is very deep. And if you've ever been to that area, to Jacob's well, it's over a hundred foot deep because they drilled it down to hit an underground river. So it, it's pretty problematic to draw water unless you had the bucket and rope and Jesus doesn't have any. And she reminds him of that. Where are you going to get your bucket? Where are you going to get your rope? 
And they start having this conversation. And it's a conversation about spirituality and faith. And yet the woman starts listening to him on a very physical level of the well's deep, the water's way down there, you don't have a bucket or rope. And Jesus is talking about a spiritual reality. Living water. Spiritual water. Nicodemus too has that same conversation with Jesus. And Nicodemus starts out on that very physical understanding when Jesus says, well, if you want to be my follower, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus kind of snarkily replies, well, how can somebody crawl back into their mother's womb and be born again? That's just ridiculous, Jesus. Except Nicodemus, his understanding stops there. And he refuses to go on and to listen and to understand Jesus. And he kind of just fades away into the night. And he misses the opportunity of a lifetime. When Jesus says, God sent me into the world. Not in order for the world to be condemned, but in order for the world to be saved. If you would only believe, if you would only trust in me. And Nicodemus just kind of shrinks off into the nighttime. Because his religion, his faith, his learning, his education, his maleness, all that prevents him from believing. The woman at the well, on the other hand, probes a little deeper. Asks some probing questions. And uh, they get to the point, Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answers, well, I have no husband. And Jesus goes, bingo, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with now is not even your husband. And of course, this is where we go off the rails with the story. Because immediately, it's the double standard. Oh my gosh, she's been married five times and she's living with somebody she's not even married to? And in our minds, we start making up the story for her of what kind of woman this is. She's someone of loose morals. She's an adulterer. You know, you know how we run wild. You know how we imagine the worst about people. And yet, if you've really paid attention, John never tells us why she's been married five times. Maybe she's been widowed five times. Maybe her husband has left her. Her husbands have left her five different times. We don't know. But we fill in the story. Because when we think of her, we think of that sinner. That person we wouldn't want to have in church sitting next to us. Because they don't live the way we live. And yet that's not even in the Bible. And Jesus goes on, He doesn't even even condemn her or judge her. He doesn't even care that she's been married five times. It doesn't matter to Him. Instead, what matters to Jesus is He says, I understand your brokenness. I understand your heartache. I understand what you're feeling. And I have something that can bring you back to joy. The living waters of God's love. And in that moment, she's hooked. She goes for it. I want this, Jesus. Because I am broken. I am empty. And I do have this hunger and thirst inside that I don't know how to quench. So please, I want what God has to offer. Contrast her with what Nicodemus did. No, I don't want it. Because that would mean I would have to admit that I'm wrong. That would, that would mean I'd have to admit that Jesus, you're smarter than I am. And I'm not going to do that. So I shrink off into the darkness. The woman, however, I get it, Jesus. You've you've listened to me. You know what's in my heart. I want what God has to offer. And then she runs off. And unlike Nicodemus, who just disappears, she runs back to her village and she starts preaching. And make no mistake about that. She starts proclaiming to the entire town about who Jesus is and what He has to offer. 
And if you read down a couple of more verses, it will say, and within that Samaritan town, hundreds of people believed in Christ because of what she said. And in John's Gospel, boom, she's the first preacher you encounter. A woman. Shocking, isn't it? It's not how we've been brought up. Contrast those two people and their responses. Contrast how Jesus responds to both of them. And it's utterly amazing. The message that we find in this passage. We're living in a world today where Christianity is falling apart. The church is embroiled in so many scandals. You have the Catholic Church with all their sexual abuse scandals. What you probably haven't heard of is in the Protestant churches. Last year there were over 700 sexual assault and rape cases filed against ministers. Horrible. People are leaving the churches in droves. And one of the things they continually point out is the the hypocrisy of it all. Of Christians pretending to be one thing and then they turn out to be something else. They're sick of the fact that no one is listening to them anymore. That no one understands their pain, their brokenness, their emptiness. Instead, we're just so quick to judge them as a sinner. I have an aunt. She belonged to a church that didn't believe in divorce. And when she married my uncle, a divorced man, she was never allowed to come forward and take communion. Forty years of her life cut off from the sacrament of Holy Communion because a bunch of men decided she was the sinner. And that broke her heart because she loved her church. All across our country, uh, people are being shunned by churches because of the lifestyles they lead, because they don't quite fit in with how Christians should believe and behave. Somebody sent me an example of a letter they got from their home church that said, you're obviously unwilling to repent of the lifestyle choices you've made, therefore we are withdrawing from you. You are no longer welcome in our church until you repent and confess your sins before everyone. I got a huge chuckle out of that. But at the same time, oh my gosh, people are doing that to each other? Christians are doing that to each other? Have we not got that backwards? The woman at the well, why is she there at midday at noon? Because when you come to draw water from the well, you always come in groups of different women because of safety. And you always come in the morning or in the evening when it's cool, not in the heat of the day. Why is she there by herself? Because everyone in her town judged her as a sinner because of the fact that she had been married five times and she was living with somebody, not her husband. And she was an outcast. And Jesus met her there in broad daylight. And didn't condemn her for her lifestyle. Didn't talk about her sins. He talked about her brokenness. He listened to her pain and said, you don't have to be this way. You don't have to be in pain all the time. You don't have to be empty and lonely. God is waiting for you. We we have that message backwards. We're very quick to condemn and to judge. We're very quick to label people as sinners or saints, forgetting the fact that within our hearts runs that borderline between sainthood and sinner. We forget Paul's message that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We forget all that because there's something about the Christian message that we hear and take and we place ourselves on a pedestal And we look down on everybody else. And people are getting tired of it. And people are leaving the church in droves. Because they're no longer finding the living waters that Jesus talks about. 
People are broken. People are empty. People are lonely. People have done bad things. We've all sinned. We all know that. What people are looking for is that second chance of someone to say to them, I don't care what you did. I still see you as a child of God. Come on and be a part of us because we're all broken people. None of us are worthy of God's love, but thank God He gave His grace so that we could all be here. That's the church people are looking for. We've got to get out of this cultural war that we're waging in this country. Judging people for abortions or for their homosexual lifestyle. Judging people because they're in the bar on Saturday night instead of the pew on Sunday. we got to quit that. And we got to start seeing people as people again. We all face terrible choices. And we all, we don't have the wisdom to make the right choice. Half the time, we don't even have the strength to. And we do things that empty our hearts. We do commit sins. And Jesus says, I don't care. I just want you to know that you can come to Me and find forgiveness. Nicodemus was given the football Scripture. John 3.16 For God so loved the world so much He gave His only begotten Son. It's sad we don't, even, we don't read further than that. Because what Jesus says I came not to condemn you, not to condemn the world. I came in order that all might be saved. That is the power of God's love, the purpose of God's love. And the church in our modern age, boy, we got that backwards. We are too judgmental, we are too quick to condemn. We look down our noses at those who aren't Christians. We look down our noses at those who don't believe like us when, I mean, belief has nothing to do with this. It's what's in our heart that matters. Do we have love? A love that has accepted God's grace? A love that is willing to be forgiving to others? We pray that prayer every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer. What does it say? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, others, and us. Why don't we live that? You know, the most loving people I've ever come across are those who have been forgiven the most. The people that think they don't need to be forgiven at all are some of the most hateful and judgmental people I've ever seen. There's something about being able to accept the gift of grace that makes us loving people. The woman at the well, she realized, I know who I am. I know what I've done. And I know what I need. Nicodemus, oh, I'm so self-righteous. God's lucky to have me. I don't need you, Jesus. Where are we in these two stories? Who are we in these two stories? America is a broken place. There's lots of broken and empty people out there. They're starving. They're thirsting for God's love. They don't need another judgmental jerk telling them they're going to hell. They need someone to remind them, you are a child of God. Come and be loved by the community of faith. May we pray. God, gather up the brokenness of our lives, the sinful pieces that we've made, and through Your love, knit them back together so that our hearts might be whole again. God, we have all been victims of hellfire and brimstone of people 
beating their Bibles over our heads, condemning us for what we have said, what we have done, and for who we are. Thank You, Lord, that You still in our pain and rejection whispered the promises of Your love. And I pray that no matter where we are this day, no matter what our brokenness may may be, and if that brokenness has been caused by the church, that we could say we're sorry and that we could make amends. God, use our faith and our love to bind up the wounds of so many and help us to restore Your kingdom and Your church to the belief and love itself. For Your grace is amazing and Your grace has forgiven us all. Amen. While we were yet sinners, God poured out God's love upon all of us, washing us of our sins that we might be free of our brokenness and our chains. We come to the font to remember God's love. We come to the font to feel the living waters and to drink deeply of God's grace. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, God's grace is here waiting to forgive us all so that we might have life and have it abundantly. If you have water nearby, dip your hands and remember your baptism with the ancient sign of the cross. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took a simple loaf of bread. He gave thanks to His Father in heaven. And breaking the bread, He gave it to His followers. And remember who they were. Simple fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. People the world had rejected as nothing. And yet He told them, through you, I will build My kingdom. Come to Me, all who hunger and thirst, and you will have life. As they ate that evening, Jesus would take a cup And He would pour some wine. He would bless it. And He would give it to all with these words. Take and drink. This is the cup of life that I pour out for you and for many. For the forgiveness of your sins. This is why I came. So that you might have life. That you might have redemption. May we pray. Father, we gather here in this place and we gather here from around the world to share with one another these gifts of bread and wine. No matter where we may be this morning, gather the elements together and pour out Your Holy Spirit that they might become for us the body and the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior that we who hunger and thirst from the brokenness of our lives might eat of the bread of heaven and drink from the cup of life and know how deeply we are loved, how deeply You have committed to our salvation. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Redeem us, save us, and make us Your people that we might live again in joy amidst the broken pieces of our lives. As we drink this cup, we worship you. As we eat this bread, we honor you. And we offer you Lives as you have offered yours for us. We remember all you've done for us.
do not belong to any church or to any group of Christians. They belong to God. And these are the gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome to come and receive God's love and grace. Amen. If you would like to receive communion today, simply come to the front. But please uh, maintain social distancing. We got a little excited last week and kind of did the football huddle. But uh, coming from, we'll start from the back and work our way up to the front as we take communion. Please come if you are ready. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, Master, Savior.
before we close today, we have two people that are wanting to join our church. They're coming from other Christian denominations, so we do not have to rebaptize them or anything like that because we believe all baptisms are valid. But would Joita and Paula come up? Uh, both have been a part of our widow's support group, supporting all of us in our journey of grief, and they've now come and asked if they can be a part of our church, our life, our ministries, and all that we do in our community. And really, all I need to ask you, since you're baptized Christians, is will you support this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Amen. Well, welcome to the faith. (laughs) simple as that (laughs) receive the benediction may God's grace and love the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit surround your hearts wherever you may be to remind you that despite your brokenness God still loves you so deeply that He sent His Son so that you might have life Go in peace. Amen. Go in peace. And may the good Lord bless and keep you. May the good Lord bless and keep you. Till we meet. Till we meet again. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.